Washing waves and breathing winds push the tides forward with enough force to condense carbon. Deposits of flint in chalk cliffs pop pebbles along the shore like frog spawn, abundant and hard to walk on. Not as satisfying as soft sand, but neither taste all that pleasant. Things like this, science can account for pretty well. Like why is the sky blue? Or what happens when you leave metal in a microwave? Everyday phenomena will often have a shroud of the mystic, until a book or a classroom reveals the wizard behind the curtain, a figure of knowledge that wasn't half as interesting as the original spectacle would lead you to believe. On one of these otherwise unassuming plots of pebbled posture killers, something would make its way to the foam wash line. Something more than the usual prophylactic packets discarded next to needles pointing the bad way, and the dreaded ringed turtle killers. An object which a handful, yourself included, will come to find has a little bit more tucked behind the curtain. That little bit more that Dorothy was hoping to find and once found. She'd have wished for a timid version of Frank Morgan. Dorothy wasn't strolling down the beach, you might be, but someone certainly was. Their little French bulldog, too. A French bulldog roughly five times Toto's size guided a short standing chef along the little lace seafront, not on the stones, but on the path above. A fractured walkway that saw less love than Gacy. More foot traffic than an online fetish site. The sea had a bright, shimmering quality to it on this day. The tide was high, and the waves were tranquil, moving in a leisurely back and forth perfect for losing an hour or two skimming stones across the glassy seal of the sea. That wasn't the motion of the dog walker aimed to go through. Dressed in a greasy chef's jacket, yellow in color and yellow would your face go when you heard the price. The chef in question had agreed to clock out the kitchen and clock into professional dog walker, a role he never grew tired of, unless she started running. Nala, come down, he called. She answered with a bark and returned to walking pace. You're gonna take my arm off one of these days, the dog walker remarked. The pair continued on for another 20 minutes before passing a bench that practically drew the strolling pair into its wooden frame. There was nothing wrong with the bench, but what it held that had any kind of a law. Standing over the bench from behind, the dog walker asked his companion, What's this girl? Pointing at a white rock, perfectly rounded, perfectly smooth with a bright red dot in the middle that had a chalky quality about it. Nala took the question as command, proceeding to collect the stone in her mouth as if it were a bone or a chew toy. Her walker yelled out, Put that down, now! She refused, leaving the dog walker no choice but to pry the object from her grasp. The dog walker was left with a slobber stain to occupy the rapeseed oil stains on his sleeve. Dripping in spit, one would assume the red chalk dot would cease to remain on the pale object, yet it remained. Rubbing and scratching at the mark, nothing seemed to remove the signature left on the rounded rock. Holding the thing felt like grasping a telephone cable, power surging through, veins becoming copper wire conducting an abundance of energy through every cell in the dog walker's fiber, a feeling that would extend without skin stone contact and with one taste, it became something the dog walker could not see himself letting go anytime soon. Every waking moment was spent thinking about this stone, driving his every urge, taking the wheel, and propelling him through his daily working life, until the moment he could be in the presence of the stone once more. Within a month of finding the object, the 20-year-old chef had risen to the rank of head chef. Not a single ticket came back to the pass, not a single complaint in this kitchen, and not a single thing could hold the chef back. After two months, he began to crave the stone's power at all times, consuming him so that it would always remain in his pocket in the kitchen. At least, he tried. One evening as the kitchen had closed, bringing the final mop stroke along the grease-ridden floor, degreaser stinging the burns on the fleshy part between his thumb and index finger, the chef took his favorite possession with him on a night of excessive drinking. Awaking the next day in a vicious, chilling sweat, the chef took a minute to gather his bearings, taking another few to get a glass of water before realizing, no. I didn't. He did. He lost the stone in a drunken stupor. Was it at the bar? The walk home? Where was it? The same three questions rung around his head like a gong to the ear. Work needed him there in an hour, but he needed to find the stone. Frantically fitting Nala's collar, they took haste out the front door, almost knocking over a stroller and the baby it contained. The mother screamed obscenities in their direction as the chef picked himself in the leash up. His idea for bringing Nala was educated. If he felt such a connection to this object, maybe Nala, who had the thing in her mouth, could hunt it down. Who's walking at this point? We humans tend to rely on faith, out of desperation, and we often misplace it in others when it should be in ourselves. Where the chef was concerned, Nala did manage to locate the stone, more or less where he first thought it would be, outside what must have been the last bar he had staggered his way out of. This information came to him when Nala began to run at her top speed. He called for her to slow down this time. She didn't. She couldn't. She couldn't resist the stone's allure as it drove her feet faster and faster forward. Nothing was stopping her, not a call or a pull from her master. 
Her mast had gripped so tight for so long that when he felt his arm rip from the socket, when he saw it fall to the ground as blood spat from the hollow socket, he still ran after the leash, if his limb was still connected to his body. It wasn't until Nala got the stone in the chef, passed out from blood loss, that either of them stopped. Nala licked and nuzzled the stone for a moment before running off, leaving her master behind. Nala trotted at a moderate pace west of the bar where she had left her master for the gallows. It wasn't her fault, she's just a dog. A dog under the influence of the stone. She went past the Japanese restaurant that would only accept cash, past the pavilion and continued further west towards St. Peter's Church. A yellow paved ground was the precise spots for all the skaters not quite confident enough to take their craft to the park just yet. The more experienced crowd had never been too fond of newbies. A fountain surrounded by patches of grass in between either side of Lewis and London Road was the meeting point for the three soon-to-be housemates, only none of them knew they would find each other here. One was on the walk of shame, one was en route to finding a shower the plumbers were in, and the third simply needed some air. The third friend, Gregory, a borderline psychotic exodict who paid less attention than he did for acid back in the day, and while a husk of a human being remained, any substance of existence that may have once occupied the space now persists on through a life of fragmented and implanted memories that felt like scattered dreams in the boy's deranged mind. The other two, Blaine and Liam, were a pair of Welsh students who had relinquished their studying cocoons and begun spreading their wings in the form of a formulaic system to live their lives in line with their goals. Step one, move to a new city. Step two, send it. In actuality, they hadn't a plan much like they hadn't intended to walk by the same fountain, but they did so anyway. No way, Blaine yelled out of surprise, making Greg jerk his head to the left. How did this happen to them? Liam called out, forcing Greg's head to jerk once again to the right. You guys tracking me or something? A half-serious quip from Greg, whose addiction to paranoia often presented itself through his speech. Now, nah, man. I've been at Sally's, Blaine replied with a smirk that was indicative of his antics the previous night. Builders are in. I was on my way to Jordan's for a shower, but this is mad. Liam had just about finished talking when Nala scurried up to them. She must have been after a familiar smell, and she was carrying a white oval stone. Hey, Nala. How are you, girl? What are you doing here? Liam began scratching the back of her neck while she bobbed her head playfully. She can probably smell you, bro. Dogs love the smell of ass. Shut your mouth. She can probably smell Sally on you, cheeky git. Blaine and Liam had a habit of bickering comparably to a married couples of over 30 years. Not wanting to leave the pub on her own, the boys decided to walk Nala back to the chef's place, hoping to find him panicking and calling everyone he could in an attempt to find his hound. Instead, when they arrived, they found nothing but unheard knocks at the door and the chef's father's parking spot empty. Maybe they had gone out for a walk and would be back soon. They waited an hour or two before deciding their hypothesis was wrong. So, they took Nala back home, and Gregory, feeling the same feeling as the bulldog and the chef, pried the oval stone from Nala's mouth and kept it in his pocket. He too felt a surging of energy course through him like a track of toy electric cars, feeling an urgency to push his writing and push it hard. He did so for an hour before realizing Nala's infatuation made it extremely difficult to put a single paragraph together before losing the coveted flow. Writing was the only thing he felt he could do well. The only thing that made him feel complete. His one complaint. He couldn't do enough of it. Not with bills to pay, a mouth to feed, and a craving for love he now felt prepared to handle after a messy ride to self-improvement. He had been so distracted by Nala and his now electrified urge to write that he had forgotten about an arrangement he had made with a lady this evening. It was about six o'clock. They agreed to meet at seven. He grabbed his bright yellow raincoat and shut the door behind him, the stone still in the pocket of his brown sweatpants. An hour had passed at the house, and Nala had had enough. She was chasing her own tail until she vomited. The boys thought it best to take her on a walk, but regretted their choice when they, luckily, lost their grip and she bolted towards St. Peter's. Greg had met a blonde lady on rollerblades online where most one-off flings occur. Something felt different this time, and both were excited to see where it went. He couldn't skate on blade or board, but his self-awareness and humility were endearing. He found her mind to be so acute that he wanted to know more about the intricacies of her life. Finding that she loved plants, he began to call her Poison Ivy on rollerblades. Because he's just so original like that. Half an hour of goofing around and twenty questions led to a quiet sit down on the grass where a glance or two was exchanged before Greg felt a stronger pull than the law of the stone he had forgotten was in his pocket. The soft hand of a gorgeous lady. She and he drew closer as they aimed for the penultimate moment of any date, the meeting of lips. As he could feel her breath on his nose, she froze briefly. She turned her head slightly to a bulldog, leash following in tow. She was still frozen in anticipation, too stunned to react before ten stone of French bulldog pounced on his scrawny figure and sunk her gnashes into his fleshy throat. Poison ivy on rollerblades froze again, 
unable to do anything but stare and discuss at her date's demise. Some things are better left on the bench they were found.